Hi everybody and welcome! In today's video I'm going to discuss an interesting article that came out back in September which tackled one of the most important issues that humanity is facing today, the COVID-19 pandemic. In this paper, researchers provide an interesting methodology for diagnosing COVID-19 through cough sounds. This paper is not only super interesting because it has this revolutionary application that can help us fight again our fight against COVID-19, but it also sheds light on how we can use AI audio for medical diagnosis and more in general in the health industry. The paper is titled COVID-19 Artificial Intelligence Diagnosis Using Only Cough Recordings. It was written by a group of researchers at MIT. Their names are Jordi Laguata, Ferran Waito, and Brian Subirana. Okay, so uh, this video is going to be divided into two parts, really. The first part is going to be a high-level introduction to the paper and its implications. And the second part is going to deep dive into the details. So if you're interested in only learning about the gist of the paper and this great application, just bear with me with the first part of the video. But if you want to get the nitty gritty uh, details of this research, just watch through the whole video. Okay, so let's get started. COVID-19 is a major issue worldwide. At the moment of this recording, already more than a million people died of this disease. In order to fight this pandemic, we need effective ways of diagnosing this COVID-19. And unfortunately, right now we have a few issues with uh, diagnostic systems. So for example, the viral tests that are the most reliable are quite expensive. In order to test the entire US population, for example, the government should spend almost $9 billion. Viral tests also take a lot of time to get results. And it's difficult to screen large portions of the population with viral tests because it's a logistical challenge. So the authors of this paper tried to came out, come out with a solution that could actually address all of these issues. And their idea is that you can diagnose COVID-19 through cough sounds using artificial intelligence. This idea rests on a, an assumption, and the assumption is that people with and without COVID-19 have different cough sounds. In other words, cough it can be a predictor for whether or not you have COVID-19. Is this uh, assumption reasonable? Well, it turns out that it can be reasonable because uh, you have doctors that uh, listen to cough sounds all the time to diagnose or at least to get an idea of whether or not you have a certain respiratory disease. Okay, but how does this system that the uh, researchers mm, developed work, uh, work? So it's quite straightforward. So you basically create a, or a forced cough sound and you have a device which can be your smartphone or it can be a laptop that records that sound, that, that analyzes that sound using an artificial intelligence and you get back a result. Either you are positive or you are negative. So this is a super straightforward uh, methodology like system that can run on any device really. So as you can guess, there are many, many benefits to this kind of AI audio driven diagnosis. So first of all, you will get results in real time. You, you don't need much money for the test itself. That's because you just have an app, for example, that you can download on your smartphone and then it doesn't cost anything to do the actual uh, test. And also, if we are using like this system uh, in the form of an app, so this all of a sudden becomes accessible to anyone worldwide, right? And this is like in stark contrast to access to viral tests. And another like great plus is that this um, diagnosing uh, system is absolutely non-invasive. 
Okay, but now you may be wondering how does the diagnosis system developed by the authors work? Well, it's basically a binary classifier. So the idea is to take a lot of like sample data and these sample data are basically audio files with cough sounds. And some of these cough sounds are associated to uh, people who are COVID-19 positive and others are associated to people who are not infected. And so we use this data to train a neural network uh, using a binary classification approach so that the network learns to distinguish between uh, people who are infected and people who are negative. So uh, I think like an interesting aspect of the work of this um, researchers was the results that we get here. So the results are extremely interesting and positive. So uh, on the wider population, they reach a 98.5 sensitivity level, which basically means that if you have 100 uh, COVID-19 positive people, the system will be able to detect 98.5% of them. And with this, we have an associated false uh, positive rate, which is uh, almost like 6%. So it's very, it's quite low. So if we then focus only on asymptomatics, so these are like people who have COVID-19, but they don't show any symptoms. Well, sensitivity goes up to 100%, but in exchange, you have to trade off on false positives, which basically means we get like almost 17% false positives. Uh, yeah, a false positive rate. Okay, so... Uh, as you can imagine, there are many different uh, use cases for this type of application, but authors suggest these three use cases, which I find very interesting. So first of all, we can use this type of application for daily country wide screen. This is like very important because it could help us just monitor the population and just control uh, newly formed outbreaks. At the same time, I think like an amazing use case is for those countries that for one reason or another can't afford to have viral testing um, done extensively. And so they could use this application in order to test their uh, population. It's time to dig in more into this paper. And I'm sure one of the questions you have is how did researchers have access to a COVID cough sound dataset? Well, they didn't have one, so they built their own through a dedicated website that they developed. So here's the website. So as you can see, you are asked as a first thing to select your uh, native language. Then you just like agree, and then you are asked to record your cough. The cool thing about this website is that it's cross-browser, cross-device, so you, you can record uh, the sound of your cough from your smartphone, for example. At the end of the recording, you're asked to provide uh, sets of answers to multiple choice questions regarding your diagnosis, whether or not you're positive, and regarding demographics. So how does this COVID-19 cough data set look like? Well, obviously, uh, researchers had variable length cough audio. They stored like these recordings as WAV files and they had 2,660 COVID-19 positive audio samples. And the ratio uh, between positive and negative uh, subjects was one uh, to 10. So way more people who were negative than uh, who were uh, positive. Okay, but so this was like a highly unbalanced data set where like negatives or negative samples are way more than positive samples. So in order to train their uh, models, what they did was kind of like filtering uh, their COVID-19 cough data set. And as you can see, they arrived at a total a data set which um, the total number, which a total number of samples which was 5,000. 320 so it's basically they they had like the same number of positive samples as well as negative samples and here you can see how the 
um, the data set is distributed across like a gender and across different uh, symptom and diagnostic. Cool. Okay, so moving on. The interesting thing that they did was uh, the first step for them was that of pre-processing the incoming audio files. So they took the data set and they uh, applied a couple of pre-processing steps. So the first one was that of segmenting the audio files into chunks. And the second one was that of um, computing male frequency sepsial coefficients or MFCCs from uh, the audio file. Now, if you're not familiar with MFCCs, I highly suggest you to go check out this video where I provide a detailed explanation of what male frequency sepsial coefficients are. So I'm not gonna get into the details there, but I'm gonna give you like an overview moving on. So now let's try to visualize this pre-processing steps. So um, the first step is just, okay, so they're reading an audio file so what they do next is they segment the audio file and they take six seconds long um, audio chunks like this. And then they use a, uh, the next step instead of like converting the, the waveform to an MFC, MFCCs. Now, if you're not familiar at all with MFCCs, you can think of them as a way of representing, well, of like convert a feature that you can extract from audio um, files and which can be thought of as a kind of like 2D image, right? Um, and here on the x-axis you have time and on the y-axis you have different MFCC uh, coefficients and the colors here that you get in this heat map is how strong a certain coefficient, uh, the value for a certain coefficient is at a certain point in time. So in other words, this is a 2D representation uh, of the original sound. Okay, now if you want to know more about MFCCs, but also about uh, like audio features for machine learning in general, what I highly suggest you to do is go check out my series that's called Audio Signal Processing for Machine Learning. Okay, so we have our two pre-processing steps. Now, what about the architecture? So that's the, the heart of this paper. Okay, so this is the architecture in a nutshell. Don't be scared by all of this complexity because I'm gonna break it down for you guys. So let's go uh, step by step. So we start with uh, audio MFCC input. So we input MFCCs directly like into uh, the architecture. And here we have like the uh, different audio ch chunks. So cough one, cough two, cough three, cough four. These are like six second segments and over here. And then we move on to the next step, which is called that of the biomarker uh, models. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of this yet, but I, so I'm not gonna explain now what these uh, vocal cords, lungs and respiratory tract or sentiment or muscular are, uh, but what I want to focus on right now is the architectures themselves that they used, right? So as you can see here, they used three ResNet 50 architectures, and these were all in parallel. So what are like ResNet architectures? Well, ResNet is a very famous um, type of um, convolution-based architecture, and ResNet stands for a residual network or residual neural network. So this type of network has convolutions and it has like one important thing like which characterizes it is skip connections. So what are skip connections? So let's take a look at a representation of a ResNet here. So we start with, a, uh, with uh, an input. Uh, which can be an image or it can be like our MFCCs, for example. And then we have like a convolutional layer. Here we have like a pooling layer. Then we have a series of convolutional layers. And each uh, layer is fed into the next. But sometimes we have these skip connections like this, where you, you basically have a layer, the, the output of a layer like that jumps and gets over like two or three other layers. 
Now, if you're wondering why we have this particular uh, architecture or this uh, the skip connections here, that's because this helps fighting the van vanishing gradients problem. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of what vanishing gradient, um, the vanishing gradient problem is, but yeah, if you're interested about this, I have a whole series about deep learning for audio with Python, which you can check out and understand some of these things better. Now, so in a ResNet, usually towards the end, we have a global average pooling layer, and finally we have a fully connected or dense layer. Now, uh, depending on the number of layers that we have, we can give different names to ResNet. So ResNet 50, for example, implies that we have 50 layers in our residual network layer, uh, residual neural network. Okay, so now let's go back here. So in other words, uh, like in the biomarker models uh, block, we have three ResNet 50 um, architectures which work in parallel. So they process uh, the information in parallel. But before that, we have this Poisson mask um, uh, process. And this is really like a, you can think of it as a pre-processing uh, step. Now I'm gonna get into the details like later on, but so imagine we get like as an input, like all these like MFCCs, then we apply this Poisson masking as the first step. And then we have like this uh, three different um, uh, processing that happens in parallel in this th three different ResNets. Okay, so what next? So yeah, now we are out, we, the information gets out of the biomarker models block and the next step is that of concatenating the data that comes out from these three different resonance. So we concatenate those together and then we apply a global average pooling uh, layer. So once we've done that, we move on and we now have a dense layer with 1024 neurons. And here we have a nonlinearity, which is a ReLU activation. And then the output layer is a single neuron with a sigmoid activation function that enables us like to have a binary response. So here we get the COVID-19 diagnosis. In other words, here we either get a yes positive or no negative. Okay. So there's also another piece of output that we have from this system, which is this longitudinal saliency map. And so what this is, is a series of uh, metrics that the um, system like puts together and puts it like on a diagram like this, that then doctors can analyze to get a better idea of how the, the model like, came out like with uh, a certain prediction. Okay, but I'm, quite sure you're wondering but what are like these biomarker models and so now it's time to dig deeper into each of these different four elements so what are this so what is muscular what is vocal cords lungs and respiratory tract sentiment and why do we need like for these models like to be different uh, at all and why do we call them biomarker models okay so for understanding why um, researchers like went down like that road, we need like to understand what didn't work. So researchers initially tried out simple CNN architectures, but they found that those architecture didn't work well. They failed to provide reliable and accurate uh, predictions or diagnosis. So what they had to resort to was complex CNN-based models encapsulating acoustic biomarkers. Okay, so now the key here is acoustic biomarkers. And so, but let me explain like what these, uh, what these are. And to explain what these are, we have to take a look at some research that the same research, uh, researchers uh, worked earlier on. 
So this is the MIT Open Voice Brain Model. So now the intuition here, uh, like on the side of the researchers, was that it's possible to come out with Alzheimer's diagnosing, diagnosis by looking at acoustic biomarkers. So here we have like a bunch of different uh, biomarkers. Certain, so there's a biomarker that looks at, uh, checks like muscular degradation, other biomarkers that focus on changes in vocal cords, changes in mood and sentiment, or changes in the lung and respiratory, respiratory uh, tract. So what this means is basically that Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately, has a change on all of these like things, on vocal cords, on mood, on lung and respiratory tract and muscular activity so, and capability. So what the researchers came out with was uh, finding certain uh, acoustic biomarkers that were associated with all of these changes. In other words, they found ways of um, having like certain metrics or a certain, um, yeah, features that could capture all of these biomarkers. So the changes in vocal cords and mood, lung and respiratory tract. And they could use like the voice of the patients for uh, getting information about all of this stuff. And so you can think of like of all of these acoustic biomarkers as pointers to all of these biomarkers or features that unfortunately are affected during um, Alzheimer's disease. And what they did was like training like this complex model with m different models that sub models that focused on each of these acoustic biomarkers. And so what they came out with, with was with this open vo voice bra brain model, which had a 93.8% accuracy for Alzheimer's diagnosis. Now, what's the intuition here? So, because you may be wondering, okay, but this is all good and great, but this is about Alzheimer's, what about COVID? But there's something that connects the two things. So here, the intuition is that for Alzheimer's, there are certain neurological impairments, right? that unfortunately uh, starts to kick in when like the, the, the disease uh, progresses. Now, these neurological impairments can uh, be uh, identified through acoustic biomarkers. And in other words, we, we can diagnose Alzheimer's because the neurological impairments that are a, caused by Alzheimer's can be um, identified through acoustic biomarkers. Now, the interesting thing is that COVID-19 also kind of like elicits certain neurological impairments. Fortunately, these are only temporary neurological impairments, but these are, for example, the, the loss of uh, smell or taste. And now the idea is that perhaps we can use the same acoustic biomarkers that we use for Alzheimer's in order to uh, understand whether like someone has COVID or, it, or he or she doesn't, because the idea is that both Alzheimer's and COVID-19 uh, in a sense are, um, have like an underlying condition of neurological impairments and acoustic biomarkers are proxies or pointers to those neurological impair impairments. And so that's why we can use the same models. Okay, so now th the cool thing is that all of these biomarker models block is based off the work that researchers uh, did on the open voice brain model. In other words, the biomarker models block here is the MIT open voice brain model. Is that a uh, thing? But then obviously like the researchers like built on top of that because they started with just a pre-trained model and then they used some transfer learning for um, tailoring like, those models to uh, this particular problem, which is that of COVID-19 diagnosis. And the cool thing here is that in this very complex system uh, that uh, researchers built for COVID-19 diagnosis, uh, the authors injected domain knowledge. In other words, they 
thought that by providing like models that are capable to understand vocal cord changes or changes like in the lungs and respiratory tract or in sentiment, then the the overall like classifier COVID nineteen diagnosis system can be benefit can benefit from from that, and so. Here we have not just a black box model, but rather a combination of a purely deep learning approach with a domain knowledge driven one, which is super cool. Okay, so now let's try to take a look at each of these elements um, in isolation so that we can understand what they are and how they contribute to the overall system. Let's start with muscular the muscular degradation biomarker. Now. So the idea here is that we can introduce muscle degradation by modifying the input signals. And this has been extensively done uh, in the past. And how, do we, how can we do that? Well, we can use a so-called Poisson mask to simulate muscle uh, degradation. In other words, we take a Poisson distribution and we apply it to the input so that we modify the input and we simulate muscle degradation. And it turns out that the way to simulate muscle degradation in an analytical way is by using a Poisson, by modifying an input signal using a Poisson distribution. Okay, but now you may be wondering, what's a Poisson distribution? Well, this is a Poisson distribution, and this is a type of discrete probability distribution that's capable of uh, capturing many real-world problems which are discrete. A Poisson distribution can be used to describe the probability of the number of events, of same events that can happen in a certain time span, given we know the usual average number of events that happen in the same time span. So uh, let's take an example here. Uh, imagine you want to describe or have like more insight into the number of people who go to a restaurant, number of customers. So. Say, for example, like on a restaurant, you know that uh, every day you get 100 customers. So with a Poisson distribution, what you can do is predict or have the probability that tomorrow you're going to have 102 um, customers rather than 95 or 80 customers. And so let's take a look at the... Um, at the visualization of this uh, distribution. So here on the x-axis you have the number of events that in this uh, formula is given by n and here on the y-axis you have the probability. So let's take as an example this green curve here. So for each number of events, say for example one, you have an associated probability that that can happen. Now you see that you have like a maximum uh, like around here, right? And so this is equal to four. And if you take a look at here, in this legend, we have that this green uh, rectangle or like, square uh, ha says like lambda is equal to four. And that's because lambda is the other parameter, which is like the average number of events per in a certain segment. And indeed, here, this lambda is the average number of events. Now, how can we apply this to muscular degradation? Well, in our case, we can uh, plug into lambda the average of the MFCCs. And so once we have that information, what we can do is we can apply or sample a number from a Poisson distribution uh, using this equation here and apply that number to i or capital I, which is an MFCC coefficient, a, sp a specific one. So we do apply a Poisson distribution to an MFCC coefficient and what we get is the masked coefficient. So here we have the, mm, the Poisson masked uh, coefficient. Okay. And so this way we simulate muscular degradation in our input signal, which is MFCCs. But you may be wondering, but 
why should we introduce muscular degradation so why should we simulate that and this is not even something that we learn in our model well it turns out that if you remove muscular degradation then you increase the error rate regarding like the diagnosis substantially so it works so it empirically works and this is just based off like some domain knowledge that the authors put into this system so it's quite interesting and as i said this is like the first uh pre almost like a pre-processing step and then we lead that information in parallel into the three other different biomarkers the first of which is the vocal cords biomarker so uh, what's the intuition here well the intuition is that whenever you have a certain lung disease you are going to have a different vocal cord response. In other words, for example, you could say that the phonation threshold pressure changes when you have a lung disease or when you don't have it. And so what's a phonation threshold pressure? Well, that's the um, minimum amount of air pressure that you need to put out in order to uh, put your vocal cords uh, in motion. Okay. So with this intuition, what uh, the authors did was uh, creating a model uh, that could provide information or create a representation of vocal cords, sounds and change. So how did they do that? Well, they use a, a very interesting approach here. So they trained a wake word model. So what's a wake word model? Well. Uh, if you've ever used Siri, so you when you address Siri for the first time, you have to say, hey, Siri, I want to do this or want to do that. And when you say Siri or hey, Google, uh, so you have a wake word model that's listening constantly to that activation word. In the case of Siri, it's Siri. In the case of Google, it's Google. And... Uh, if it recognizes that words, then it activates and it continues like reading or like um, kind of like trying to process what you are saying. So in the case of this vocal cords by marker, so the activation word for this wake, wake word model is mm, which is not really a word. It's more like a phoneme, a universal phoneme. And so in order to train a weak word model with mm, they, what they built was a ResNet 50 uh, architecture and they asked the uh, network to discriminate the word or to find the word them and them because you have this um uh, sound at the end of this word so how did they do that well they used a data set that's called a Libre Speech, where you have a bunch of uh, audiobooks. And then what they created was a binary uh, classifier, which had uh, either them or all the other words, right? So these were, were like the two outputs that the uh, model could, yeah, just like predict. So the validation accuracy that they got was 89 percent, which was quite high. But you may be wondering, but what does this have to do with um, diagnosis for COVID? Well, the idea is that at this point, uh, the network has learned certain acoustic features that are connected to vocal cords changes. So we can use this representation and use some transfer learning on top of this pre-trained model to optimize for COVID-19 diagnosis and using this as a uh, first bio, bio, biomarker. Okay, so the second biomarker, it's called the sentiment biomarker. So here, the basic idea is that whenever you have a disease with some kind of neurodegenerative decline, like in Alzheimer's disease, what happens is that uh, people tend to get uh, certain, in certain moods. They tend to get frustrated. They tend to get doubtful. And that's because of like the, yeah, People are just, just like frustrated um, for a number of reasons, right? So basically the intuition here is that you can perhaps um, 
kind of like learn like this feature, like that of like sentiment and use that to um, provide better uh, prediction, reg medical diagnosis, um, diagnosis for COVID-19. And that's because COVID-19 unfortunately elicits a certain level of neurodegenerative decline even though it's uh, temporary and so it may well be that people who are who get COVID-19 get more doubtful more frustrated get all those sorts of moods which are associated with neurodegeneration right and so that could be a pointer to the fact that you have COVID-19 so that's basically the intuition behind this sentiment biomarker. So how did they train this model? So what they trained was a speech sentiment classifier. So once again, they used the very same architecture, so ResNet50, and they trained this model on a RAVDAS, which is a speech data set with eight emotional states. And the classifier was trained in order to recognize different emotional states in just speech and uh, they got a validation accuracy of 71 percent so this was the second um, acoustic biomarker and once again what's important here is the representation that's learned by the model that perhaps can provide useful uh, information and can be valuable for diagnosing COVID once you do some transfer learning. Okay, the final one, and it's the one that's more related like to, to I would say like to, to the cough sounds itself, is this idea that uh, lung and lungs and respiratory, uh, respiratory tract change over time. And so we ha can have like a, an acoustic biomarker associated to this, which can uh, tell us whether you have COVID. So uh, in, in this sense, like the, the, the proxy, the pointer to lungs and respiratory uh, tracts, the acoustic one is the cough sound or forced cough sound. And basically the idea is that cough is effective for diagnosing respiratory disease, right? And we already said that this is like a, a, um, an assumption that can hold true also like with human diagnosis. So how, what did they do here? So they trained a classifier to detect the mother tongue from cough sounds. So here out of like all the data set that they had, so the MIT open voice for COVID-19 data set that they got it, uh, f with the website that I showed you earlier, what they did was creating a model, a binary classifier using once again, a ResNet 50 architecture that could discriminate between English and Spanish um, native speakers based off the, their cough sound. And they got to an accuracy of 86%. Once again, the, this um, a problem or like this application is not interesting in and of itself, but it helped uh, the authors to build a model that perhaps learned certain representations of a cough sounds that were useful also in the case of COVID-19 uh, diagnosis. Okay, so now we have an idea of how all of these different um, acoustic biomarker models were trained and developed. And so here we can just like go back and see what happens here. So as we said, we have the Poisson masking, uh, masking that adds this muscular degradation as an initial step, almost like a pre-processing step. That inf muscular, uh, muscular degraded uh, input gets passed to the three uh, models for vocal cords change for lungs and respiratory tract change and sentiment right and those are the ones which do like the heavy lifting and then we get information out of that that then we concatenate in the next step now here the authors used a couple of like trick well 
different like combinations or like they 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 trained different models uh, to understand uh, what worked best and the basic assumption was that if they used the pre-trained uh, models for these three acoustic biomarkers then the um, predictions the diagnosis would be better because this pre-trained model provided interesting uh, feature representations that the COVID-19 diagnosis system could leverage to, to become uh, more accurate. And so what they did was basically training the baseline model uh, without any uh, like pre-trained model. So like all the weights for all of these networks were completely randomized. And then they compared those results against the pre-trained model. And so here we can uh, see the results. And so we'll take a look at what this means like in a second, but let's start like from these ones first. So like the complete. So here, what the complete means is like the, the full system that we saw earlier. So the, the full architecture with all the different um, acoustic biomarker uh, models. And so as you can see here, we have like no pre-training and the accuracy is slightly above 85%, so 87%. 86, I would say, percent. When we move to the right-hand side of this diagram in the pre-training um, situation context, here, complete performs better. So in other words, uh, the transfer learning that the authors use has a positive effect on uh, the, the overall system, because here we reach probably 87, 88% in accuracy. Now, here uh, we have like no vocal and no sentiment. So this is like the same model, but without the acoustic biomarker for vocal cords. And here we have the same thing, but without the uh, acoustic biomarker for uh, sentiment, right? And so here you can also compare how the different... Um, um, acoustic biomarkers contribute to the diagnosis itself. Now, if you're wondering about this uh, dotted boxes, so this is, this is like the extra boost that you get whenever you have also the lung and respiratory uh, tract biomarker in the model, okay? So, for example, like uh, if you like drop this, you would have like a something like that's like below 75% accuracy in this case for the complete model. But obviously it's complete without the um, respiratory tract um, acoustic biomarker uh, model. Okay, so here at a glance, you can also see that uh, regardless of the type of uh, model or a sub model like that we are using, usually pre-training helps. So doing transfer learning and using like features that have been learned on those other like situations for the different acoustic biomarkers helps the accuracy and the quality of the diagnosis itself. Okay, so uh, we are like towards the end like of this uh, video. Now I want to talk a little bit about the future work that the um, authors suggest. And so they are currently undergoing some kind of clinical trials in hospitals to see whether, I mean, to, to I guess, to get more data and to see like the validity of their system in a, in a more real world setting. And they're also collaborating with a Fortune 100 company to see whether like this system can help streamline diagnosis like in societies or like in a, in a company like this. So what they would like to do, like moving forward, is the idea of tailoring the models for different demographics. For example, for people with different age and ethnicity, and this could definitely like benefit the models because like people with different age and ethnicities may have like slightly different sounds of their cough. Okay, so I think like before we close like this long video, uh, it's nice to just like take a look back at what we've learned and uh, yeah, and reflect on that. So first of all, we can say that AI audio can be effect for medical diagnosis. And this is like an amazing thing. 
uh, because like it's something like to a certain extent like unexpected because you would expect that other things other uh, like data types may be like better to do diagnosis but from what we've seen with alzheimer's and also obviously with covid-19 like audio can be a strong uh, like data type for doing medical diagnosis the second point that I want to highlight here is that high level acoustic biomarkers can diagnose different conditions. And this is like quite unexpected because if you think about it here, we basically used certain models that were uh, built for diagnosing Alzheimer's and then we reused them for COVID-19. So who can think, who, who could could think that like doing like this kind of like translation from one domain, from one disease to another could work, right? So this is like quite surprising and perhaps like it tells us also like something about how like different diseases have an effect on production of sound in human beings. The third point is uh, really interesting for me and is that that domain knowledge can improve deep learning algorithms quite a lot. And we saw in this case that the quality of the prediction, uh, which is quite high, as we saw, the quality of the, the diagnosis, um, can be improved by injecting domain knowledge in this black box algorithms. And in this case, it was all of this information regarding acoustic biomarkers. This is something that I've seen over the last few years happening quite a lot, obviously not just like in medical diagnosis, but also like in music information retrieval or like um, sound classification. So injecting information about uh, kind of like semantic information or stuff that we know as human beings, that domain knowledge can help the uh, algorithms perform better and be more explainable. And finally, an interesting thing is that MFCCs still work great, right? So usually in audio classification, what you see used are other types of audio features, like for example, spectrograms or MEL spectrograms or even raw audio. MFCCs seem to be a little bit a thing of the past, but it's nice to see that uh, they're still, uh, I mean, really good at a classification in the audio domain, even when they're used in conjunction with deep learning um, techniques. Okay, so that's really all for today. Before I dash off, I want to invite you once again to the Sound of AI's Lab community so that you can continue the discussion regarding this paper and other stuff. I'll leave you the link to the, um, the sign up link to the Sound of AI's Lab in the description box below. And here, this is a community where you have people interested in all things AI, music, audio and signal processing. So if you're interested in these things, I highly suggest you to go there. So I hope you enjoyed this very long video, but I felt like it was such an interesting paper to dig into, to really understand that I felt like it's nice to, to take the time to, to provide all the details that come with it. Uh, okay, that's all for today. I guess I'll see you next time. If you liked the video, leave a like. Cheers for now, bye.